how we do. And oh my God, in the lounge space for the first time, these three gentlemen, Park Like Setting, Yai Big Mac and Roll, and Bazooka Joe 204. Salute, fellas. Good to um, see you, buddy. Yes, yes. It feels weird saying that after we were talking, like before we were live, but no, this is this is right. momentous. <laughs> Man, I'm just so glad you're just still doing your thing, Angelo. It's dope. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I could, you know what I'm saying? Like the fact that X amount of years later, we've all got a little salt and pepper guaning, but we're all like, I feel like we're all kind of where we're supposed to be. We still love this shit, which is yeah. hilarious and good. Yeah. Yeah, for real. For real. So this is the first time in the lounge space for two of y'all, but, but, Yai has been in the lounge space before. So just to, to update him, we always start off by asking our guests how they were introduced to hip hop culture. So who wants to go first? Let's age before beauty. We'll live <laughs> All right, I'll go first. Uh, well, I was a punk rock skateboard kid who hung out with a couple guys that were much, much ahead of the curve on hip hop in Brandon, Manitoba. And their names were uh, Tyler Sneesby and Patrick Skeen. And they happened to be my best friends, and they pulled me into hip hop by saying, "You got to listen to this guy's De La Soul. You got to listen to this guy's Public Enemy." And I was trying to listen to Nirvana. I was trying to listen to the Pixies and the Smiths and uh, Depeche Mode and uh, Dead Kennedys. And they they turned me around, and um, my best friends made me into a hip hop guy. And then next thing you know, we're making pause tapes in '91 and doing our things. So that's that's the short answer. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Joe? <laughs> uh, my older brother started a b-boy crew called the Icebreakers in Churchill, Manitoba. That would have been about, I think, 86. Um, that's so that, that, got me <laughs> into the, that got me into the music. Um, songs like, you know, like like, you know, it wasn't like he was really into like obscure stuff, right? If you get into B-Boy in, in northern Manitoba or Canada, you're listening to like the Breaking soundtrack and Beat Street. So it was like Rocksteady Crew, um, No Stopping, you know, Chaka Khan was in there. Uh, so that was the music. And then him and his crew were breakdancing in, a, in Churchill. There's a big center called The Complex. And it's this big brutalist kind of structure. It looks a little bit like the movie Aliens. You know, it's it's a little bit sci-fi, but uh, basically it connects the town of Churchill so you don't have to go outside because of the weather and the bears. Mm. So there's a big hub in the middle, and in the hub was all the cool shit. There was an arcade. Okay. Um, there was a movie theater, library, hockey rink. All that stuff was centralized. And then there was a couple arteries for the school and the hospital, but um, tourists would hang out there. And so the icebreakers would break dance for the tourists. The tourists would throw money at them. Uh, I, you know, I was taught how to like, you know, do some basic stuff, the worm, you know, backspin, na, na, na. And then at the end of the show, I would come in, you know, because I was, you know, seven years old or whatever I was, you know, so, so the, they were like 16. They would do a whole routine at the, and then at the end, I got to come on and do my little thing and the tourists would throw money at us. And that was, uh, that was my ex initial exposure. Dope. That's Ice great. Breakers. Ice breakers. That's Gotta a great name. It. Gotta love it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I kind of stumbled across hip hop fell backwards, uh, pretty early. I was about eight or nine years old in, 88 89 uh moved to winnipeg from calgary and the school i happened to go to catholic school saint john ray buff uh there were a bunch of kids that were early on to hip-hop there um so hey buddy um yeah so we started listening to you know some of it was just the rap tracks and things like that but you know big daddy kane cool modi uh fresh prince um yeah, and it just never went away. Other stuff didn't resonate with me at all. And I was like strictly rap, all rap, some R and B until I was probably 17 before I expanded my horizons at all. So when when the three of you individually were were 
exploring the culture and and then actually involving yourself and participating and like picking up a mic what was the family thinking when when they see you know one of theirs suddenly wanting to be a rapper Uh, oh somebody <laughs> like i i hit it for a long time okay so until okay. until i was like battling and 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 linked up with roddy i just kind of kept it on the hush mm. uh i you know i remember like a redneck cousin finding a tape that i made at gum shoes and playing it and i got roasted for for weeks after that <laughs> um <laughs> but you know like uh, my my folks are pretty cool as far as they didn't really interfere with us a lot. We were just kind of wild, feral, kind of maniacs let go into the world. There wasn't <laughs> curfews or any of that. Like, I, I feel like, you know, my mom's from the city, but but moving from the country, move, moving from Churchill to the city, not much. You couldn't rein us in. Right. So, you know, there was never pressure to like, go to university or any of that stuff. So but by the time they started to become aware of it. I was already getting recognition for it and doing something with it. And just okay. doing something was enough for my folks because the, yeah, alternative, yeah, yeah. Uh, the alternative is, is doing a whole lot of shitty shit, right? Yeah. True that, true that. So. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, listening to rap real young, um, I think it was a logical progression for me. I think my parents had already gone through the, you know, no, you're not getting sex packets. What is that shit? No. <laughs> you know, they never came at it from a, like, you're not listening to black music type of thing. They were never on that tip, uh, right. but they definitely didn't understand what we were doing, but they were, they were okay with it for the most part, other than, uh, you know, kiboshing a few, uh, a few dicey album covers. Right. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. And when it came time, you know, it was, uh, I mean, I remember the first time ever here in, here in McEnroe, um, you know, like I got my, I was living in Porters and Prairie at the time. And when my parents would come into Winnipeg, they'd be like, do you want anything? And uh, I remember reading an article about Farm Fresh and they picked up the first Farm Fresh tape for me on New Year's Eve, 92, 94. Nice. Um, so yeah, like they were, they were pretty cool with everything for the most part. Sick. And, and my big brother, like also very instrumental in putting me on to some really obscure rap and things like that. So, uh, you know, he was all for it. We should remind the younger listeners that Sex Packets is an album. Oh, not a <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Danny asked oh, me, Sex Packets, you have to know that that's an album. <laughs> good point, Joe. Thanks. This is why we're and, a good team. <laughs> and I'd like, I'd like to point out that you just said to all the younger folks, we're, we're in that space now where we are, we are actually saying that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, man. We're yeah. there. We're there. I, there's three dads in the box here, so yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm still, I still feel like the, you know, the, the rookie in the group. But it's, yeah, man, we're way past that. <laughs> it's yeah. been a while. One thing, one thing that I can say that I've had had the pleasure and the honor of of bearing witness to has been all y'all. Each one of y'all has come up. Yeah, I've had, I've had the pleasure and the honor of, of bearing witness to that, and. I love the fact that in 2023 that we're sitting down right now being able to talk about it still current still, you know what I'm saying? We're not just reminiscing. Like we're going to be talking about some new shit, some new 2023 shit that is. And, and with, with hip hop 50 with this year and everything, I don't know about y'all, but there's, I've had a mad ton of reflection this year. Yeah. And I mean, perspective is really, really kicked in. So now moments like these to me mean a lot more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I want to hear because what Roddy said later, we are... when he started rapping. <laughs> yeah, um, man. We're going to this. So do I. What was such an evolution? Over I was Brandon. Like, I was just always out of the house skateboarding. If I wasn't skateboarding, I was playing in very bad punk rock bands. And then, and I was always with my friends. So it was just like, what are you guys doing? Like you're skateboarding and you're playing, playing at the school with your punk rock band. Oh, now you guys rap, whatever. Like it was just... Yeah. Yeah, it was just all kind of like, you know, and by the time it was more serious, I was out of the house. You know, I basically stole all their good records. That was kind of the only thing was like, 
you know, where's my police synchronicity record? Well, I'm sampling it so you don't get it back, right? Like <laughs> anything that was even half decent, I was trying to mess with on the turntable. And that was more of the impact than really, you know, and then, then with the amusement, seeing me actually on a stage and seeing kids buy our tapes and all that. So they were supportive, but it was just sort of, you know, I wasn't young enough for them to have any kind of say in it. Yeah. It was just kind of like, what's he up to now? You know, meanwhile, I got good grades and everything was fine. So there wasn't any right. red flags. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Now, for for people who are not aware, Big Mac and Row, Pip's Kid, DJ Honeycutt, Farm Fresh, was kind of the, the impetus and, and like the jump off for Peanuts and Corn. Uh, John Smith came along a little bit later. Yai, on his own, was coming up on a whole nother side. But then y'all came together as park-like setting. So one thing that I would like to ask is, other than the fact that you're homies, how did you know that you three could get together, make a record that you could actually be happy releasing? For this record or just in what, as we formed? As you formed. Well, I think the thing with Park Lake was, it was, I was very much group oriented and the Farm Fresh disintegrated, right? So right. it was yep. like, we need a new group. And Joe was there and down and wanted to be in our circle. And so that was the new group. And at the same time, Pip formed Fermented Reptiles. So we had two, where we had one group, now we had two really good groups and then a crew and all that kind of stuff. And then I think the evolution of what Park Lake was and what how we wanted to work with, with Danny um, as we got ready to do the second album, I don't know whose idea it was, but it was like, you know, we feel like rappers, rappers, like we feel like we're really good writers. And we just really liked when we did the second record, it was like, let's, you know, where Craftsman was the name of the album. And that was the approach we took. Like, let's dig in here and just take, take what we do well, which is, you know, what we think our writing, you know, and, um, and so that sort of continues. That's, that's, what continue with this new record these all these years later is like let's write let's write together someone take the lead but we're always down to jump on and you know have these you know whether it's my idea or joe's idea or danny's idea as a kernel to start something where we just have that energy that is on the same wavelength where we can jump in with each other i feel that i feel that now one thing one thing that that we should definitely do is is just take a quick aside and give these three gentlemen their flowers straight up and down because you are are part of 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 a collective that has been at the forefront of rap on this side of canada you know what i'm saying when it comes to this side of canada you guys really really made the mark peanuts and corn is an institution when you think about rap in canada and that is it's unprecedented and, and no one can argue that how does it feel looking back now knowing yo you laid some serious groundwork i feel like um long time ago i heard mocha only talking about his output and this is this is 15 years ago right <laughs> yeah he read a lot <laughs> and he said something that stuck with me and it's interesting that it's him because there's really, when it comes to output over time, like if we're talking about being prolific, it's Mocha and it's Ryan, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know many other Canadian hip hop <sighs> artists. Mocha's in another league of his own. I'm not anywhere close. To yeah. Well, but, but even then, right. Who's the, who's the next, who, who's, mm -hmm. who else has over 30, 40 releases, right? Like Jeez. maybe, maybe Noah 23 from out of, in Guelph, you know, but right, like, right, right, right. Maybe but, moves too. Yeah. DJ yeah, Moog, yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. But, um, but yeah, Moak said, uh, I don't know why, uh, everybody keeps asking me about my output. No one stopped uh coltrane to ask him about his output at any point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know nobody stopped art blakey and asked him about it at his output at any point because it's just that's it's just the thing you do right like that's yeah. we just do this thing and so we've just done it for a really long time um obviously we're in a different space now than we were in the early 2000s when it felt like a race to like get to the forefront of indie rap and then see yeah. what happens yeah but but you know like 
I, it's, it's like asking a fish what it thinks about water. You know, it's just, we're just in it, man. Like it's it's always going to be in it, doing it. Right. So it's very natural for us. The idea that you're supposed to quit rap at a certain point, that it's an (laughs) immature thing. We defy that lyrically in, in everything we do. Right. Like even when we're goofing off, we're, we're constructing it in a, in a, in a certain technical way, or we're exploring like mature themes, you know, like, we're not talking about what the kids are talking about, which seems to be, you know, either like being angry at haters or, uh, or, you know, like being sad about a relationship or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> so, so, you know, like it, this is the rare occasion when it's appropriate to say it is what it is. Right. Like the, the output, it, it, it was then and it is now. When you started thinking about the new record, how how far back are we going? Was this something that you've been thinking about for a minute? Was it something that came up during the pandemic? Was this a yesterday thing? When when did the idea for it start to flesh out? I mean, I think the the first kernels of it that that turned into songs uh, that made the record were probably I want to say November twenty twenty. Is that okay. something right, guys? Probably something like mm-hmm. that where we started to, you know, exchange uh exchange some verses here and there. Um, you know, I mean we're we're always talking. I mean, we're all good friends here. Um and you know, Roddy's always sending us new beats, um, different ideas for projects, nice. whether or not nice. they, they turn into something and stuff. We're always nice. we're always working on something. Nice. So um yeah, I'd say November 2020, and then it really picked up steam. I don't know half year later probably and summer of 21 i got a beat pack from roddy that was designated for this Mm -hmm. now we're we're doing this thing right yeah okay and on that beat pack the two standouts became stupid juice and get the bozak Bozak. hey (laughs) god damn yeah you know i'm I'm digging bozak yeah, and even like stupid juice, like we mean like stupid, like get stupid, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, crazy yeah. stupid. So, yeah. so those those were part of the first like thrust of it. And I remember thinking about those like, okay, this is b boy shit. This is retro b boy shit. This is a these are big bangers. We could just talk some shit on them. We could just style on them. We don't have to go like high concept on this. And mm-hmm. so that was the first couple jams, and then. I think we just kind of things just progressed in that way where it's like, all right, everybody's rapping on everybody, every's verse. There's a bunch of hooks with multiple voices on them, like kind of banged out, like, you know, naughty by nature or rotten rascals or some shit like that. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so it, it, all it takes is a couple to get us rolling. And then, and then after that, there was no overarching narrative to it, but the deal was, was we wanted to make, a b-boy record we wanted it to sound like a crew rap album which you know there's not a lot of anymore and then the the theme just kind of came with having you know three mcs on every song no guest spots it's our third album you know calling it this that and the third it just came together you know so that title is so apropos yo so great (laughs) so apropos yeah but you guys never had problems with titles I got too many titles. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm notes, I got all these titles. song titles, and it's like, I can't, I mean, I can't really write this song. I can't write this song, but I have a title for it. Yeah. You got to do, I, uh, you gotta do like Drake and do a coffee book table book of just titles. <laughs> Every page is just one, you know? There you go. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. And you can throw What I do up. is if I do an instrumental thing, I just clear out all the titles I can't write. <laughs> I did the noodles last yeah. year all those song titles are just titles i couldn't write yeah you gotta, the book could be like those greeting cards when you open a greeting card and it, and it <laughs> yeah, plays yeah. happy birthday every song <laughs> title could be the instrument the instrumental plays when you when you turn the page over <laughs> say word say word yeah physical Yo. media is back <laughs> <laughs> It's not just song titles though. And it's not just it's not just the catalog because that's unmistakable and it's undeniable. But the one thing that that people really had to appreciate was that the aesthetic was there too. 
there was very much a peanuts and corn aesthetic. It was on everything. It pyramided everything. You were literally, I mean, you are, not, not were. I mean, it's a complete package. Literally, a complete package. Still. I think a lot of that came also from, from Roddy doing the production, running the record label, you know, um, whether he's, he's doing the covers or Honeycut or saying, like, it's all in-house. Right. So I think that, you know, that, that just came from my perspective. I don't know. Roddy's, Roddy's more in it than I am. So. Well, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. And, and some of, a lot of that early aesthetic was based on old skate stuff, right, Rod? I mean, it was kind of like like the like the first stuff we did with the tapes. You know, I remember there was this guy Mark Kubis in Winnipeg, and he designed. He would do the layout because we would do the design. Like mm-hmm. Pat drew the alien on the space EP, but right. and this guy Mark Kubis picked the fonts for a lot of those choices that he made that kind of you know stuck with us. But then and then I bought a computer in like '97, and my friends and I would would just download as much pirated shit that we could. So then I learned Photoshop and I learned all that stuff, and so it was just like that sort of set to set the. Uh, tone for the design based on what I could download off the internet for free in 1997. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a dial-up modem, right? So, it's, Yo, but that in-house, that in-house design was, I mean, other than keeping the cost down, I mean, it was just perfect. It was literally lots of, lots of photography and a little yeah. bit of type, you know? Like, we, we figured it out real quick and then just went with it. I don't know, if it might have been out of necessity, you know, like you don't have to over design something when you have an interesting photo, you know, like I'm, I'm talking on Roddy's behalf here, but yeah, well, I mean, I always like photography and Tyler, especially always been into photography. A lot of his photographs ended up being covers. And then just from there, like that was the aesthetic we liked. And then it became our aesthetic. And as things have moved on, it's like the thought of, and then, and then it's just necessity, right? Like me knowing the math behind everything all the time <laughs> the business side of it and all that is like mm-hmm. well are we going to rent a <clears throat> knowing how many copies we're likely to ship and all that back in you know the even at our peak in the 2000s where we're shipping thousands of copies which is great but still just thousands it's like we're not renting a we're not renting a studio and we're not getting like a ten thousand dollar lighting package to do some kind of like you know crazy cover because it's like we need that money for whatever else we need it for. Right? Exactly. So, exactly. Couldn't afford to rent Chocolair's ice throne. For the- <laughs> exactly. No ice throne. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real thing, by the way. Yeah. People who don't well, he got it second hand on Prodigy, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he had to pay customs to get into Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that aesthetic, I, I love that aesthetic so much. Y'all may or may not recall, but Tyler shot Michelle and I's wedding because that aesthetic, I loved it so much. I was like, yeah. Uh, and I, to, I asked him, like, would you be cool? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, sweet. That's that's, that's how much I love that aesthetic. Cut. Everybody at home. We're yes, getting a little inside baseball cut. here. Tyler's Hell, DJ yes. Honeycutt. Yeah. Maybe, well, yeah, you John, got, maybe you should have got him on this. <laughs> and John Sledowich shot my yes. wedding, right? Punk rock yeah. photographer, like toured with Propaganda. He did a lot of... Uh, punk rock album covers as well as shooting like fermented reptile cover and all that kind of stuff so yes that same aesthetic right the old yep. you know punk rock photography and all that which is something i've always loved and then just you know tyler has an eye it's more than i do like tyler went to art school so he takes a lot right. of credit and i kind of followed his lead in a lot of ways for that right. and saint louis also being a good photographer yep. loving photography yep. he shot all the photos for this um for this record uh, same kind of deal, right? Just that love, and it hasn't changed. You know, a lot of stuff has changed, but taking a good photograph and doing a good, non-smiling look at the camera by a rapper is timeless. <laughs> you know, I think one Scowl. of the reasons. I, I think one of the reasons why I love you guys is because you're basically a, a group of creatives that are homies that basically just said, "Fuck it." We're doing this shit and we're doing it our way. And then you fucking did it and you fucking pulled it off and, and definitely made your mark in Canadian rap. Yeah. Well, 
that's that punk rock shit again, right? Hell yeah. You just do it yourself. You don't have to get permission and you don't have a lot of resources, right? So you just go. Um, yeah. And I mean, I was lucky because, you know, Farm Fresh had the thing up and running by the time I got there. So, uh, you know, all that, uh, all that learning, all that uh, putting it together on a base level, that's, you know, Roddy gets all the credit for that. Honeycutt gets all the credit for that. So, your influence is is also something that we can't ignore. The the influence of Penis and Corn and the Break Bread Crew. Come on, y'all. Come on. I know I'm giving you mad flowers, y'all, but it's fully deserved. Okay, take the flowers. It's fully deserved. Okay. I mean, as as the last member to join the crew, you know, I always felt uh, uh, extremely lucky to be, uh, you know, with these guys, with with Gruff, Pipskid. Ness later, you know, all of, all of the homies that are just like, what's uh, a weird little bubble in Winnipeg that's, uh, I don't know how it's here, but let's let's appreciate it while it's here, you know? The weird little bubble that blew the fuck up. Let's yeah. be real now. Come on. <laughs> well, so you know, <laughs> you guys no. are humble. You guys are humble, and I appreciate that. But oof. we like the, what your, we do. Your impact, your influence cannot be ever ignored and, and I, I appreciate how humble you guys actually are one thing about doing music now in 2023 uh, it's it's an interesting time you know there there are there are ways now where you can sell directly to your your consumer you can sell the product directly no middleman you know you can really really take ownership especially when you got something like what's happening with Bandcamp. how y'all feel about the bad camp thing the recent acquisition? Yeah. Layoffs. Not good. Yeah. Not good. I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I did you guys receive any sort of notice from Bandcamp about? No. no. I mean, I saw the news. and Yeah. But I didn't see anything. I mean, we haven't been featured by Bandcamp, so on the promotion side of it, mm. um, I would imagine that, you know, it seems like a shame as far as, you know, it's, it seems like a, a good, vibrant community and people really yeah. do like the support. And really, that's yeah. kind of it. Like, you know, the streaming thing is, the thing with us is that we're older, right? So if you're not going to go out on the road and do play live, which I haven't played live in nine years. Nine years. Um, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm a father and all that kind of stuff. I want to make this music. I want to share with people. I uh, want to continue to explore music and I'm still doing that. But unless I'm not, you know, my life, has, I have other elements in my life. And so the only way for people to really support us is things like Bandcamp or else you become a merchandise salesman, which I'm not that stoked on, you know, mm. like, I don't know, I have no hate for anyone, but I personally am not trying to be a t-shirt salesman. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't hate anyone who does that because that's the, that's the reality of it. But it's just yeah. like, I've got, you know, I, it, there's enough t-shirts in the world yep. and uh and so unless you're in, so really that comes down to band camp is kind of what's left where it's like you can communicate directly with fans you know we've got i don't know how many thousand that follow us and yeah, then when you send out the data. thing people the people people you know pay you to for your music which yeah other than that the streaming thing is pathetic satellite radio was a thing and now that's kind of gone so it's very, very challenging right now as far as, and, the, and, the, and then that comes back to the DIY thing where it's like, I would love to pay like someone like Rec to do stuff for our design because he's a better designer than I am, like mm. times a hundred, but mm. I can't insult him with like 200 bucks to design a CD cover, right? He's worth yeah. more. Yeah. And so it's this sort of like, we don't sell enough in 2023 without touring and without all the other stuff to really not just do it all ourselves because that's just reality now right so yeah do you think that as the band camp situation starts to unfold because just based on what i'm seeing what i'm reading and things that i've heard like it's really not looking good well i mean they bought it for a reason so are they yeah are they going to try and shit can it like why would they why would they ruin it I mean, you could say, why did Elon buy Twitter to ruin it? But yeah. I don't understand why. I don't know why this any company would buy Bandcamp, which 
I, and I understand the costs are too high. Their their running co- their operating costs are too high. So they yeah. either have to grow revenue or they have to to drop operating costs and they chose operating costs. So we'll see what happens. But I think the machine of you know the technology works. Yeah. And yeah. how it works for someone like us, where we upload our thing, we send out the email, and the orders come in, and when exactly. that money is in our account, like yeah. moments later, that works. And that I don't think will be something they'll mess with. The question is the editorial, which again, they haven't done a feature on us. So it hasn't really, it's not like we're going to say we're going to lose a bump because there's been nothing. Right. So I think the machine will, will be there, but will the, you know, that editorial side of it seems to be where they probably target. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. It it just becomes yet another thing that started out cool with an idea <laughs> oh my God, of community yeah. behind it and then big money gets involved and, you know, fucks it up for whatever their ends are on it. But, you know, the problem, it, it's likely not going to change much for us except for how good we feel about being a part of it and interacting with it. Right. You know right. I mean? And like right. anything else, you're going to have, you know, I'm going to go off a t- on a tangent, but, it's just going to be another, you know, Silicon Valley dipshit uh, <laughs> <laughs> taking, you know, taking something that was cool and breaking yeah. it down. Right, but was it wasn't it started by a Silicon Valley dipshit looking? Yeah, to, yeah, exactly. Looking Definitely, to get it's a, a tech company. Market capitalization. Yeah, right, and then sell yeah. sell when the time is right, which is what they did. They took yeah. their money and they're out. So, but they used community as part of oh yeah getting the thing rolling right like that yeah. was yeah. that was the same with discog same with all kinds of stuff right yeah now, right it's yeah. all like it's all of it what do they call it and shitification i think shitification that's yeah, exactly that's, what they call it the phrase they use oh it. my god <laughs> but anyway, is that a word you can use in scrabble <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, I mean, let, let's be honest, even with what's happening with media, like all across the board, like things are just changing. The landscape's oh, wow. changing. I mean, no one really reviews records. Yeah. There's and that. it's in real time. So we're just kind of riding the wave as things are happening, I guess. Yeah. But it's all good because there's a new yeah. park like setting record. <laughs> so all it's is well. The third. Exactly. When when you when you put this record together. Did you know? I mean, you know, I know it started with a, with a couple of joints, but as as the other joints started to come out, did the idea start to coalesce? Like you knew exactly what the record was going to be, or was it just like, oh, yo, this works with this. Let's let's take this. This one works with this. Yeah, I think we usually write, try to write more, and then we we start to drop stuff. So I think if you saw my folder of what we're working on, there was like eighteen songs and. And a couple of them didn't get written by anyone and some were written by one person and dropped and and we had some fully fully written three verse songs that we dropped and so it just you know you just get to that comfortable point where you're happy with it all and we're all 100 percent. so our our process our process has long been not one where we're hanging out in the studio together for days on end and and doing stuff it's always been like even back in the day, it's fly out to Vancouver yeah. and you have X amount of days to put this whole thing down, right? That's your hustle, yep. Yeah. So, yep. so that's how we build the record. Nothing changed on that level where we all get a hold of the beats. We all conceptualize and take the lead on a few tracks, distribute them amongst ourselves. And, and you know, you got a record, you know, like it's, it's, uh, it's very much of the craftsman kind of thing where you know this this is the work here's the beat go go to town you know so uh, the next question i want everyone to answer individually because i I, i'm curious to see how y'all look at everything if you were to describe the park like setting sound aesthetic in 2023 for someone who's never heard park like setting previously how would you describe it Who's going first? Danny, you haven't talked in a minute. <laughs> you go first. Uh, yeah, Come on, Danny. Nice softball question, Danny. Go for it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, like Joe was saying before, I think we kind of went for some – our version, our take on kind of B-boy shit here. Um, you know, we're, we're 
getting into some technical rap, but like playing off of each other's flows. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, uh, our version of boom bap. Okay. Rod, you're going to take a stab at it? You go first. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, I, I might say, uh, you know, I might say, you know, golden era vet, golden era veterans, you know, like might be the way to say it, which is to say our primary influences, um, you know, the, the 91, 92, 93, 94 shit, like that's, that's where we're coming from with this one, you know? Um, for me, that's the most formative stuff. That's when I'm starting to write. That's when I'm, you know, picking pieces off of MCs that I like, you know, getting rid of the stuff that I don't. Uh, what is, uh, was it why okay? Separate what I hate from the shit that I like, you know, like that's, that's, you know, that's what it was is, you know, even like I was talking to my brother about this the other day we were in, we were, I think we were at the, uh, the Ralph Lauren shop. And, uh, and I was like, I just want to dress like the 93 till infinity video, you know, but like <laughs> nice. just have it fit. That's just bit. That's the goal. That's the style goal. And you could, you could probably say the same thing about the record too, you know? Okay. Feeling it, feeling it. I mean, to me, and maybe I'm delusional. I just feel like we have, yes, we were brought up in that era, but I feel like there's progression. So, you know, if you listen to a 92, 93 record, it's like there's jazz and all this, and it's like the beats are straight sampled and you could find those records. And one, the produ this production is not that. Like it's, I think it's much more advanced, it's much more nuanced, it's cleaner, it's more modern. And I don't feel like, like, it's rooted in that. It's rooted in four four time. It's rooted in, you know, those kind of temples. But it's one we're way slower than '90s rap. Like this is more of a hybrid, right? Like this has a, more more of a slow down influence. That's much more modern, and we rap better than we did then. Um, you know, we're I think we're more technical. We know who we are and our limits at this point, and we're not trying to overextend ourselves. So I don't know. I, I don't. I don't totally. I don't hear revivalists when I think of this music. I think it's just yeah. guys who've been doing it a long time that have progressed and we're not yep. progressing a massive amount. Like we're still who we are. But if you listen to us from 20 years ago, I mean, I think that there's less of a jump. I think there's more of a jump between our first record and our second record than there is say from our second record to this record. But yeah. I do think that this record is, is I'm very proud of it and very, it's very modern, right? Yeah, um, and that more you know, that, more modern anyway, with while still being rooted in like New York rap, but still having a lot of influences, you know, because we all have a lot of influences. We listen to all kinds of different music, myself included, and that comes through, you know. Yeah, and and if it's on PNC, it's produced by Roddy, and what Roddy produces kind of stands out of time, regardless, you know. Oh, yeah. um, but yeah. I do agree that uh, that there's a progression because it feels like on Craftsman we're making a show of being technical, whereas mm. on this one we're good at it. We're, know. We're, we're as good at it as we've ever, or we're better at it than we were then would be a better way to phrase that. And because of that, there's a comfort in it because everybody is really, and the other point that Rod makes is, is about it being a little bit slower is like everybody's really stretching out in the grooves you know mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. like um finding the pocket swinging when it's time to swing kind of stuff um and yeah and that only comes with experience and that that comes through that comes through and that's what i'm saying like listening to this record it was a park like setting record in 2023 but you could honestly you wouldn't know that that there was any time between this record and the last one because you guys just Voltron that shit. And like, this is what we do. And this is why it's dope because this is what we do. And Let's I mean, we, we've always been making, we never stopped making records just because we never put out a, a PLS record. You know, right. we're, we're still always making music. Exactly. And combination exactly. And stuff. So it felt really comfortable for sure. Now, 
you made reference to being rap dads. How does that feel? Like, do the kids know what y'all do? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if they're older, they do. I'm sure. Right. My Dan? kids know, but they don't. They don't care. They don't care. Nobody cares. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I. By the time I put out my first record, I was already a dad. My oldest is almost 21. I mean, you're in the same boat. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. Angelo. Uh, yep. Yeah. No, I did. my kids have always known. I used to bring them on stage in my my kid backpack yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, they don't care. They don't care. <laughs> it's not. You're never cool, man. If you're dad, you're never cool. Yeah, that's true. We can try, but it, it, we fail every single time. Yeah, yeah. Every single time. And, and and it's it's sometimes you like look in the mirror like, wow, I really am. You know, like the way my son looks, I was like, oh, yeah, I really am the dad, aren't I? Okay. Yeah. And then you sometimes wonder, so when we're together in public, are you cringing or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially, especially like because of what I, what he knows for what I do, he's like, oh, so he's like the hip hop dad. Great, I got the hip hop dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the same connotation that there was when nah. we like if if when we were growing up, our our nah. parents listened to hip hop. That would have been the coolest shit in the world. Exactly. No, definitely not the case yeah. now. And I, I knew rap was like the main shaper of style um, in North America when I started seeing. Uh, hand me ups to people's mm. lot, lots of lolos wearing Wu Tang mm. gear and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Right? It's like we, we yeah. got to that point. That was 10, 15 years ago, right? So now yeah. we're at a point where it's it's just everybody is hip hop to an extent. Yes, but uh, but whether or not whether or not you own a pair of $120 sweatpants to go to the corner store in really determines the level of <laughs> your level of dedication, right? Uh, <laughs> looking, choosing to look like a grown up is not, is, uh, is not what we're doing. You know? <laughs> you know, what's funny. It's funny. You mention a uh, sweats for, for, for a bill 20, because once upon a time, that was actually like something one would consider. As as a hip hopper, you have to consider a pair of hundred twenty. We actually would so consider crazy. shelling out that screw for that. Yeah. Oh my god. I dog. I I was on the cover of Uptown Magazine in a four hundred dollars sweatsuit. That that I bought. I bought. I bought the thickest sweatsuit I could find just to wear on tour. Because it was like the the first tour we went on, I messed up. I didn't know how to plan for it. Oh, okay. so I had like freshly pressed jeans. I had a, I was trying to hang my clothes in the minivan. Everyone was clowning me, right? <laughs> was crispy. By the time the third or fourth one rolled around, I was like, "Fuck it! I am buying the thickest sweatsuit I can find, and I'm just gonna live in this thing for the next month." You know, <laughs> Danny, what's one thing you learned that was important? that you had to make sure you were on top of when it came to touring? Uh, not losing your bags. I remember that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I remember on the first PNC oh, tour I went on, I, I uh, somehow dropped a bag somewhere between, I don't oh, know, shit. Prince Albert and Regina or something. <laughs> That's not fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it was, uh, I mean, it's kind of an attitude I still take you know, as a 40 feet, four year old, like, um, every time you touch a mic, you still just get better. Like you can still yeah. learn something from it and, uh, yeah. you know, craft your, your craft a little bit, a little bit better, fine tune yeah. something a little bit more than, than the last time you touched a mic, you know? So going on tour, which is something again, it, I was a dad pretty young, you know, um, an actual tour of more than five shows happened a handful of times. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was, uh, always fiending for that and, and loving that just day after day after day after day. Cause I mean, you know, these days it's what a couple, couple shows a year or something like that. Like, right. you know, like, I wish it was more, but it's what, what life is these days. Would you learn Ollie? You, you've had, you had some clicks on the road. What'd you learn? Most important I, thing. What I didn't, what I didn't learn was how to figure out how to sleep. So. That's oh, kind of why damn. I retired from it because I never could sleep. Really, I'll sleep it, at five in the morning and have to get up at seven to start moving to the next town. It's too well, much that responsibility. Is, that is kind of messed up, though, right? Like you play a show, like you, you're amped up from the show, 
But yeah. then you have to sleep because you got to travel in the morning. And that's just not like who does that, right? It worried the hell out of you. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I, like I, our crew was like, I think there's only one or two of us who had licenses. Myself <laughs> was one of them. So you. <laughs> so I was getting up and driving. And, yeah. Yeah. Very tiring. I feel that. I miss I playing that. shows, but I don't miss anything else about it. That's what I was going to ask next. What is the prospect of shows? <laughs> it's just complicated, you know? Like, Oh, yeah, I know. It's tricky. Like, if we all lived in the same town, it would be no issue. But because right. I live in Vancouver, mm -hmm. um, it's a bit of a thing. I would love to come out and do a show to celebrate this record. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we do. But it's a, such a narrow window with what I do for a living. Like, I... My schedule is very um, unpredictable, more than three mm -hmm. weeks out. So how do you mm -hmm. book a show? Uh, you need to book a show more than three weeks out if you want anyone to show up. So it's, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the fact that you're all grown folks. Yeah. And all have living grown folk lives. Touring yeah, is, is, is a different thing now. But if there's if any, you, any promoters looking for, you know, 7 p.m., shows give us a call man That's... nah but you know what i'm actually happy to see that early shows is really like that's an actual thing now and i'm oh, glad yeah. to see that for us yeah for real like i was talking i was talking with someone about about doing a party and when we're talking about like when to do it like typically people throw a party at like 10 right i'm like nah now let's do a 7 11 and they're like yeah we should do a 7 I'm like yeah we should do a 7 11 why are we gonna go to 2 a.m <laughs> There's yeah. no need to go till 2 a.m. No. You know no. what I mean? It's it's over. We're too old. Get in and out, get in and out of the venue and then let the let the young kids come in after and yeah, yeah. They can pay the tab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> straight up, straight up. Well, yeah. yo, fellas, I want to thank you for the time you've taken to spend with us in the lounge space. It, it's how, it's how long has wow. the lounge been going? Oh God! <laughs> it, started at, it started at the UW, right? Yeah, yeah. So what? What year? Do you know? She's ninety nine, I guess. Respect to you, man. Flowers oh. to you, brother. Thank yeah. you. Thank Seriously. you. Keeping the culture going. I mean, yep. yeah, but but I I exist because y'all exist, though. You know what I'm saying? This is part of this is part of the infrastructure. Like I'm part of the infrastructure. My my I exist because I believe in promoting dope shit and and. Y'all dope shit. So that's why I exist. Hey man, it's a symbiotic relationship. You were very much from, so from the beginning of your brother in my backpack and all of that stuff. You you yeah. always gave us uh, a lot of shine. So mad respect. Oh man, it's it's been our first yeah. interview. You did our first interview on yeah. uh, Stylist Magazine for him. That's crazy. Yeah, that is yeah. so crazy. We've had a lot of firsts actually together. This is wild. What year would that have been? That have been before our tape or after our tape? That was it was for the tape. Yeah. Weren't you promoting the tape for it? I think so. Like fall yeah. ninety four. Yeah. Right. And I shot that. Ooh, that cover. <laughs> Did you shoot the photo? I shot that. Yeah. Okay. And I was kind of riffing off your aesthetic, so you know. <laughs> Photos are funny. But the love was there, so so it's yeah. all gravy. One thing I'm I'm honestly glad that I get to talk about a Park Like Static record in 2023, and I want y'all to know, Danny knows this already because he's been on already. Even though on this particular platform we've all been together in this same like situation enough times, but I want you to know that this is an open door policy going forward. This this exists so that we can help promote dope shit. So anytime you guys have something popping, please, I want you to know it's an open door. Let us help you promote that dope shit. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, for real. Really, man. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Park-like setting, this, that, and the third, the new record out now. Please tell them how they can get this record. You can get it now on Bandcamp. So peanutsandcorn.bandcamp.com. <laughs> yes. It will be on streaming on Friday, which is, means Thursday night kind of thing dropping where everything when everything else drops midnight Eastern time. Um, it is available on streaming now with one track called Jukebox Demons you can hear and then you can pre add the song and then it'll show up on your in your device on Friday morning and you can listen to the whole damn thing. Gotta love the pre save. I'm not gonna lie. I do love the pre save. I love the yeah, fact that on Friday too. Yeah everything comes I'm like okay good. I'm yeah. gonna do shit. 
Especially um, when there's a longer, we never have a long enough runway because I never got my shit together. <laughs> you know, I think there was like a Black Thought record that came out last year and it was like pre-saved like four months in advance yeah. or something. And then it's like you forgot and it's in your phone. You're like, oh, nice. Yeah. Nice That's little it. treat. But we'll For never sure. do that because we're never that far ahead. <laughs> It's all gravy. I, I think I think you'll be fine. Uh, should yeah. we expect any visuals? Oh yeah, we gotta. So tonight, when we get off this call, um, I gotta get my ass home, eat dinner with my family. Then I got we we're gonna talk to Sam at Witch Police. Props to him. And then I have to finish editing the video for Stupid Juice, which was filmed in Winnipeg last year at Argyle hey. Studios. Hey. And. Hopefully right, no, nice. it'll drop tomorrow night. It'll be tight. It'll be tight. Sick, 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 sick. Um, Stupid Juice should be out tomorrow night. The yeah. visuals. Please let them know your socials because we are in a social media world. Please let them know your socials. What's our Twitter again? Peanuts and Corn 1. <laughs> We're going to talk someone about in, Twitter. <laughs> someone in, yeah, someone in... Someone in Ohio has peanuts and corn with like oh, that's six true. followers or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's at peanuts and corn the and then the number one peanuts and corn one. That's on Twitter. But, if you're spending uh, time on Twitter, <laughs> big video will be at Big Mac and Row or youtubecom slash Big Mac and Row. Uh, my Twitter is Big Mac and Row. It'll be on there. Peanuts and corn records on. Instagram, Bazooka Joe 204 on Instagram, Bazooka Joe 204 on Twitter, Yai with a Y. Your ears are all fun. Right. Right. Mine, mine changed forever. Let's go to the other ones because he just retweets ours. All yeah. he does is yeah. really there retweet us. <laughs> Follow the, the friend ones. list. Yeah, find right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you are, if you got mutuals, you'll find them. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. You'll find yeah. them. Before I let you go, I really, I don't know if I, if I, if I actually even got a chance to tell you how much I love this record. Oh, that's great. Thank you for listening to it. Thank you for having us. The, like, it means a lot. I could go on. I could go on, but I'm not. You guys know me. This is a dope record, okay? Legit. It I brought, appreciate it. It brought a smile to my face. Put a lot of hard work into it. So glad to hear it's, uh, it's appreciated. I am so glad that we're listening to this record in 2023. And I know that we're going to hear so much more for y'all when we do obviously come back in let's make sure and talk about it so people know what's going on thank you again to three of you thank you for everything that you've given please god damn hell yes salute fellas thanks buddy thanks, all right peasy